Welcome to the Wicked 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 Show Project Off Grid. Today is a little chit chat about solar power. Off grid. Off grid. Off grid. If you do or do not know, we have 4,800 watts of potential PV power. That's set up into three different arrays. There is an 800 watt PV array facing east. There's a 1,000 watt PV array facing west. There are three PV arrays that are parallel and in series that produce 3000 watts. But that's in standard test conditions. That's perfect conditions, perfect sun, perfect weather. Yeah, temperature has a lot to do with solar power. On average, we make half that. On a good day, you'll see 2500 to 2800 watts coming in, which will put between 20 to I don't know say 30 amps at 48 volts into our 48 volt battery bank. So why do we use a 48 volt battery bank? It has to do with wiring and uh, energy efficiency under Ohm's law. Wattage, amps, and volts. Volts into wattage will give you amps. Behind me on the wall there's an Outback FM80 charge controller we purchased for close to $600. Just saw that right now as of December 23rd 2023 for about $365. It is majorly discounted and it is a high quality solar charge controller. It auto detects between 12 and a 48 volt battery system. You can get in there and learn the command prompts and set your parameters up. But it does have, if you're using lead acid, it has pretty much an auto detect feature. But if you're doing lithium, there's a few things you have to do. You have to take out the equalizing charge. You don't want that. The way we have our setup is to shut that charge parameter off. We don't want that running. The way lithium works is you want to get it close to 95% full and you don't want to drain it below 20%. We have a giant electrical car battery. Uh, that weighs approximately 375 to maybe 400 pounds. It's encased in steel. Looks like a gas tank. There are six cells in there. They're 14S each. That's 14 cells in series. They kind of look like... They look like little Capri Sun packages, but they're much bigger. And those are all connected in 14S. So there's 14 of those. And you have the negative tab, and on the very end you have the positive tab. So they snake through each other, and they're in series. We have six of them. Once those six batteries were built, those all get parallel connected. The max volt we can charge to is approximately 56.7, and the lowest we want to go is 48 before the battery will shut off. Once it gets below there, depending on what kind of load you have, uh, you can see behind me there's these outdoor LED string lights. Uh, each string produces three watts, and there's two sets of strings up there, so we're draining six watts of power while those lights are on. But our battery bank is primarily designed to keep those little lights on when we need them and to run our refrigerator. That's it. Uh, the luxuries are the computers, coffee maker, microwave, and that evil air fryer. During the summertime there is sun early in the morning at 6 and it doesn't go down till about 9 at night and we're running the air conditioner all day. It knocks the heat out and it's pretty dry as the air conditioner pulls out the condensation dropping the humidity down. But you got to kind of be near this half of the house where the window is, where the AC unit is installed. The back of the house, it's a lot hotter there. My wife opted for a 10K unit. Well, it's going to be about double the amps it's going to draw. So the difference of the 5K and the 10K on average is the 5K lasts all day, all night, no problem. The 10K, we have to run the generator sometime in the morning. Or you have to set it to cycle. 
We set it to 74 degrees in here, try to keep it reasonable. And we do use box fans. If you're interested in solar, you've probably been on Amazon. You set it to low to high price and you see between 10 and somewhere upwards of $60. All these variant claims of MPPT little charge controller boxes. Bulk of them are 10 amp charge controllers. They're PWM. They are not MPPT. It is very rare that you find a boost buck converter inside any of those with a toroidal iron core transformer. There's a company out there called Victron, and they do sell a unit that's 100 volt VOC, open voltage, panel voltage, 100 VOC, and it has a 30 amp charge controller. They come in 10, 15, 20, 30 amp. It's a name brand. Uh, spend a little tiny bit extra money, and you get Bluetooth functionality. You can read that stuff on your phones. With a name brand comes the reliability, and you actually get MPPT. And that can boost your stuff between 10, 20, 25, 30% boost. So what the true MPP does is it brings that voltage down. So as the voltage is brought down, well, it's yin and yang. So as the voltage is brought down, uh, amps go up. And that's where you get your MPPT boost. It's kind of like you're supercharging your batteries. A true MPPT charge controller is worth the money. I'm not saying that PWM doesn't have its place in the world. Tried and true tested technology. But what happens is when you make an over excess of power, it burns off in heat. If you know anything about electrical components, thermally, the more heat you build up, uh, the shorter the lifespan of those components are going to be. So electronics don't do well with heat. So it's always a good choice to buy a charge controller that has a giant heat sink on the back or one built in with a fan to cool it off. The way solar panels work is in the sun the voltage goes down in heat, they become more inefficient and in the winter the voltage on them spikes. Once you start adding that voltage up, that, that 50 volt from that panel in the winter and that 50 volt from that panel, 100 and it's cold, you know, it can go up and above that and if it goes above that VOC marker for that unit so VOC, open voltage, once you go above that, you're either going to pop or burn out the units, it's going to shut down, it's going to melt, catch fire, blow out the MOSFETs, capacitors are going to pop, or hopefully the little DC breaker, if installed, or if you installed one in the hotline, or if it's ground-based, see now it gets technical, it's negatively grounded, don't like those systems, but usually in, in, on the positive line, hopefully that DC breaker pops uh, before your device does. You can't always rely on it though. So the lower you go in voltage, the thicker the wire has to be. So you'll see battery terminals thicker than my thumb. This is like some two watt size, but thicker than my thumb. As opposed to our 48 volt system, which uses four gauge wires thick as my pinky uh, going from our charge controller into our battery and then we have much thicker wires coming from the battery into our inverter inverters come in a multiple of flavors but some of the worst on the market are the cheap ones you see being sold they sell square wave or modified square wave inverters these are high frequency models and they put the ratings on them 2000 4000 8000 watts they just like throwing zeros and numbers they always take them for 25 percent of their rating if it's a 4000 watt model i won't run more than a thousand watts through it continuously that's not always the case. It might not even be built that well. Another common problem is people want to use high amperage devices and don't realize that a couple of batteries can't produce that. I don't care how big the wire is or what type of modified sine wave inverter you have. You're going to be pulling a ton of amps through a 12 volt system to convert it to AC. On the other hand, there are some quality pure sine wave low frequency inverters. And you'll see they're very costly for low wattage. And the reason why is those companies are fairly honest about what they can do. So a 1000 watt pure sine wave inverter continuously with a 2000 spike is going to run continuously 
for a thousand watts. So in general, you pay for what you get. The sine wave that's in there is pretty smooth and it likes to run motors. It's pretty safe for electronic devices and phones and all that kind of stuff. If you're camping or if you're in an emergency situation where you just need a little bit of power to run your phone, charge your laptop, maybe even run a 300 watt rice cooker, some of those high frequency modified sine wave inverters, eh, they'll do in a pinch. What those typical cheap inverters will look like is this. This one comes from Radio Shack. Uh, it's got some weight to it. So that lets me know that the transformer in here is fairly decent. Here the rating for the peak power for a possible 12 to 20 seconds uh, reads 1,200 watts peak. So when it starts up and jumps, I still wouldn't trust that. Continuous pull out of this is about 600 watts or less. But there you go. That's what these look like. And what we're hoping is that the way it's wired through can handle the draw power coming out the front of this. I'd have to open up and take a look inside. I'm assuming that these are both connected together. And I'm assuming that this 40 and 40 equals 80 amps. Kind of makes sense being at 12 volt high amps. So you can't pull more than 80 amps through this 12 volt unit. If you do the math, 12 times 80 amps, that comes up to be 960 watts that this unit is protected by. I wouldn't pull more than a few hundred watts through this. And it just, it is what it is. Again, it's got a lot of weight to it and it's a tiny unit. So that's kind of a good sign. Now on the other hand, we invested in an Ames inverter. That's six kilowatts, that's 6,000 watts at 48 volts. So it's fairly efficient. Uh, due to its design, I think it's about 88.7% conversion efficiency. Is it good? It's really good. Is it an excellent inverter? Absolutely not. You'd want 90 plus, but it's got two legs on it. And what that means is a hot one and a hot two. There's a neutral return and a ground for the case. So that's 3,000 watts on one leg and that's 3,000 watts on the other leg. The reason they do this is because of the inverter itself is listed as 120 or 240. If you're using 240, you would use both hot legs to draw from each of the 3,000 watts per leg, giving you 6,000 watts in total. For continuous power, it's putting a lot of pressure on that inverter to do that. I would say run it maybe 25% less. 4,000 and 5,000 watt draw at any given moment is safe for those. Once you start pushing 6,000, again, you're beating on the unit. We purchased a 240 volt water heater from overseas. That unit is rated for 6,000 watts. And you might be saying to yourself, well, you go in 6,000 watts with a 6,000 watt inverter. Isn't that going to be bad when the refrigerator kicks on or someone uses the microwave or somebody turns on the coffee maker? Your assumptions are probably right. It's probably a real bad idea. What we do instead of maxing the water heater out set to 6,000 watts, we turn it down. And that uses a lot less wattage. Thanks for watching this episode of the Wickshire Project. I hope you learned something, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye.